Anyway, the, the subject we're going to look at today is uh, how Jesus is resolute in his aim to go to Jerusalem. In the uh, 51st verse of uh, uh, Luke chapter 9, it says, As the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And in this passage, we will look and see how Jesus was so resolute, and for, unfortunately, his disciples really hadn't learnt the truth of what Jesus had been teaching them previously in this chapter. In this chapter, verses uh, 20, 18, and through to uh, uh, verse 50, there are a number of questions. And the most important question that was given to him, he gave to them, he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter, as you, it seems as usual, because he's one who does speak up, he says, he answered, you're God's Messiah. But before they could preach about the Messiah, they had to learn what it meant. Because Jesus strictly warned them that the Son of Man was to suffer. He must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day rise again. This must have been an unbelievable shock that Jesus was going to Jerusalem to suffer this death and must suffer. It was it was the most important thing there that he had to do. And if you read uh, 1 Corinthians 15, that great chapter on the resurrection, that he must rise again, the uh, victory over sin and death. Jesus was the fulfillment of the Jewish expectation because they spoke of the Messiah as a priestly Messiah, others as a king. Peter, having made his confession in Matthew's Gospel and Mark's Gospel under similar circumstances, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to the disciples he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. But Peter once again uh, went out and said, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. He still didn't believe that uh, Jesus was going to go to the cross. And it goes on in this chapter to say the requirements that, uh, to follow the Lord Jesus. And it, as you see, then he, he talked to them and he says, whoever wants to be my disciple, this is in verse 23, must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. <coughs> Excuse me. He told them that only Je not only Jesus would suffer, be rejected and die, upon the cross. They must have that same attitude and same uh, commitment and have that same intention. Why must we take up our cross and follow Jesus? He said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciples, let them deny themselves. Jesus uses this extreme language because becoming a Christian, as Jesus says in Luke uh, 14, 35, uh, those who do not give up everything cannot be my disciple. Jesus is, has to be the centre of all things. But also in this chapter, before we get to this uh, resolute commitment, we see the unusual character, uh, character of greatness in the kingdom of God. True greatness shows itself like being a child and in, uh, in being the least, not the popular conception of greatness. We've seen that in our own lives, I'm sure, and uh, also in, the, uh, in our leaders. They like to be at the front. They like to be liked. Uh, unfortunately, that's not always the case with uh, some of our leaders, but nevertheless, this is what they were doing. 
and perhaps they didn't want to expose their ignorance, where, uh, but the deepest reasons they could not understand is given in the next verse, in verse 46. The deepest reason is that they were th uh, looking in terms of greatness while Jesus was looking at the imp his impending death. They were having an argument about them, who would be the greatest. It's a parallel account that we find in Matthew 22, where James and John asked the question, who could sit on your right hand or on your left? True greatness in the passage we're looking at now is marked by steadfast determination. Jesus, uh, Jez mentioned the uh, phrase about a face like a flint. And I've looked through a number uh, of uh, Bible versions. And the only one I could find was found in Isaiah 50, verse 7. He says, because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. And that's a description of the Lord Jesus. As time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent his messengers ahead, so they came to this Samaritan village. In John, uh, John 3, verse 14, it reminds us that he was going to be lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. He had chosen to go to the cross. He was focused and resolved to be te was tested. Jesus was focused on God's plan, and God's plan was through the cross. From Genesis to Malachi, God's plan of salvation was by the cross. And how many times have you heard people say, oh, well, it might be he could have chosen a different way. If we read God's word, we see that there was no other way. It was by the cross. From Genesis, uh, from uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says this, for the message of the cross is foolishness, to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Jesus was focused on being obedient to God's plan. He would not be shifted from that plan. He knew he would be separated from his father, but he was to be obedient to the plan. I'm always amazed by that verse in 2 Corinthians 521 where it says God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us and so that in him we might be uh, we might become the righteousness of God it's in the most amazing verse that the sinless one was ready to go to that cross to bear our sin he became sin for us he bore all the punishment all God's wrath is there ever love like this? There's no other great love that we can have. Jesus was focused on his love for his people as well as his obedience. Consider that wonderful verse that we find in John 13, uh, verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that his hour had come for him to leave this world and go to his father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I always remember, I think it was, uh, I remember Phil, our previous pastor, I remember Jez, uh, saying from the pulpit a few weeks ago um, that God loves you. And he loves you so much that he was willing to suffer the most horrendous death. I was thinking of the torture, the whipping, everything. To carrying that cross up that hill, getting Simon to carry it with him. 
and yet to be hung on that cross. The Romans were past masters at torture. It was the most horrendous capital punishment I think it's ever been existed, ever existed. And it wasn't just for a day, a, mi a moment in time, but they could hang there for hours and days, struggling and uh, in the end suffocating. But he went on, he continued. And then we come into this, in this passage, this strange occasion when the people in uh, this village in Samaria rejected him. Now, when he rejected that, we don't know the reason. Some people might try to uh, uh, work out what it was, but we don't know, and there's no point in uh, pursuing that. But we do hear, once again, uh, the disciples reply. And they came with this reply, Lord, shall we bring down fire from heaven to destroy them? You know, and it seems incredible that all that they've been taught in just the few verses beforehand about greatness and what God wanted, the love for each one of us, and yet they wanted to destroy. He rebuked them for their offence, and uh, it was not appreciated, and the determination of Jesus mentioned did not mean he was, he was tough or angry. He saw that flint face of Jesus going through to the, uh, to the cross. They didn't understand it, that it meant what it meant to be focused and being more focused on love than ever before. That flint-like face, face will end up on the cross in the ultimate demonstration of love, uh, not the ultimate demonstration of anger. I resolve to use every possible method, preventing a narrowness of spirit and party zeal, that miserable bigotry that makes us so unready to believe that there is a work of God, but among ourselves. That was John Wesley. John Wesley, who said that he didn't want, he wanted solely to be focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. You do not know what manner of spirit uh, you are, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy man's lives, but to save them. Jesus explained their, this failing, their failing at this point in two ways. They didn't know themselves, for perhaps because they thought like being like Jesus or showing the character of God. They were mistaken. They did not represent God and his heart. <clears throat> the love for the Samaritans and he wanted them to repent and be saved. They didn't know Jesus and his mission. He came to save the lost, not to burn them up with fire from heaven. John, John's Gospel, chapter 12 says, uh, If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge, them, judge that person, for I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Following Jesus meant being merciful to others instead of the harshness with them. Especially we should remember that God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay it. The disciples of that, uh, that Christ who died for his enemies would never think of avenging themselves on other people. Do you remember the, in the uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount, it says, blessed are those, sorry, are those who are persecuted because of righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Don, Don, Cameron, Don and Carson, sorry, I'll read this, uh, uh, writes this. Are you among those who think Jesus in merely therapeutic terms? Jesus becomes a bit like a man on the TV commercial of British Automobile Association. 
this is, a, this is a Canadian or American now uh, saying, uh, saying this and uh, Jesus is a nice man. He's a very nice man. He's a very, very, very nice man. When you break down, he comes along and fixes us. So all the focus is on you and your brokenness. But the real Jesus, the historical Jesus, is resolved to go to Jerusalem. His fixing, his fixing of people is radical. He goes to the cross, bears their sins, and pours out his transforming spirit on them, commanding them and enabling them to take up their cross and follow him. And as I come to a close here, I'd like to read Hebrews 12, verse 2, which is this very verse written by the, I, we don't know who the writer to the book of Hebrews is, but he writes this under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who like for the joy sent before, before him, exp, uh, endured the cross, scorning the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That is Jesus. Why he went, he fixed his mind and his, uh, his desire to go to Jerusalem, that he might complete God's work on this earth and that he might ascend to heaven and be seated there. And also in Romans it goes in, uh, uh, sorry, in Hebrews it goes on to say he is seated there making intercession for us each part and each moment of the day.